Now let me introduce the second speaker for today. Uh, just a second. It is John Oliver Hand who co-curated this Washington Italian exhibition and you all know him. John Oliver Hand is of course one of the very long known major figures in the research of early Netherlandish painting and uh, John already started at the National Gallery of Art in Washington in 1965. I hope that is right, John. And he became a curator there in 73. And during this long time <coughs> at the National Gallery, and well, it's, it's a long period to do research, and so did John. And one of the most important things, I think, <coughs> in the field of early Netherlandish art was his collection catalog written in cooperation with Martha Wolf and published in 1986. That was, to my knowledge, the first of a new modern type of scholarly uh, collection catalog. And uh, I remember very well when I bought my copy of it. <laughs> it was one of my first uh, really scholarly publications uh, on Netherlandish art and it has become a model for all the subsequent <clears throat> collection catalogues in Frankfurt and in London and so on. So most important included in that catalog of course was one of the most beautiful if not the most beautiful work that is preserved by Michel Zito and that is the portrait of, the man, of a man called Diego de Guevara. That's exactly what John is going to tell us about. Uh, before he starts, I would like to mention that he, of course, did not exclusively work on that catalogue and on Zito. He's also very well known for his work on Jos van Kleve. There is a monograph and many other things. And, of course, John has been involved in quite a lot of exhibitions, uh, like uh, Unfolding the Netherlandish Diptych, uh, Prayers and Portraits, I think was the title, and so on. And, of course, I'm especially interested in your talk, John, as this is going to deal not only with the painting in Washington and presently here, but also with the second half of the diptych or maybe even the first half, the Virgin and Child in Berlin. John, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Stefan. It's good to be here. See if I can do this. Yeah, for the first time in a long time, the Virgin and Child in the Stadtliche Museum to Berlin, Gemälde Galerie, and the portrait of Diego de Guevara in the National Gallery of Art in Washington were brought together for an exhibition, uh, as you've already heard, entitled Prayers and Portraits Unfolding the Netherlandish Diptych. Uh, between November 2006 and May of 2007. The show is at the National Gallery of Art in Washington and the Koninklijk Museum for Schone Kunsten in Antwerp. Uh, on the screen is an installation photo from Washington. And yeah, over here is the diptych, which as you can see, we reframed for the show. And if there were any, any doubts about that the, uh, the fact that they originally formed a diptych, they were immediately uh, dispelled by putting them, putting them next to each other. Uh, one of my favorite words, it was coined by Disraeli, which is anecdotage. And as you get older, everything reminds you of a story. And the diptych exhibition, uh, I could do a whole nother lecture on anecdotes involving that. But, getting pictures together from two different museums and getting them framed together was an experience. Uh, for several years, in advance of the opening of that show, a team which included Catherine Metzger and Rans Frank conducted technical examinations and documentation of the Netherlandish diptychs requested for the exhibition. As a result, I can tell you the following about the Virgin and Child in Berlin. 
The picture is painted on a single piece of wood, identified as oak, with a vertical grain, which is inserted into an auxiliary panel and cradled. Uh, because of this, dendrochronology was not possible. The, there are remnants of a barb along all four edges, that all the way around here. Uh, and this is the X radiograph and overall of the painting. And the detail of the eyes, maybe x-rays are not easy to read, but you can see that there are two sets, at least two sets of eyes in there. And there are changes in the position. Also examination with infrared reflectography, that is IRR, indicates that as, as regards underdrawing, a dry material was used for a sketch that was further developed in a liquid medium. There were changes and adjustments throughout but note in particular the changes to the child's eyes. Again, in here. Where the child is looking is critical to the relationship to the figure on the facing panel, as, as well as to the viewer. Uh, turning to the portrait, it is painted on a single piece of wood with vertical grain, identified as oak, the picture is cradled and also dendrochronology was not possible. On both lateral edges, there are irregular uh, additions that you can kind of see here and also along here. Things have been added, uh, so there's, there's not original. There are, however, traces of a barb at, uh, at the top and at the bottom. Uh, the original barb indicate that the heights of the two panels are within half a centimeter of each, of each other. Oh, sorry. Yeah, here is the IRR, infrared ref reflectography. Uh, and of course, the two panels are linked, by, as, as Till has already explained, so that the carpet that goes across from one to the other is, is a device that was used by Memling in the Neuenhofer diptych of 1487 in, in St. Jan's Hospital in Bruges. Uh, in the Berlin Virgin and Child, there is a lightly pigmented layer that is not present in the Washington portrait. The identification of the sitter as Diego de Guevara rests to a large degree on the belief that the diptych was in the possession of Mencia de Mendoza, third wife of Henry III, Hendrik III of Nassau and that it is the work described in a 1548 inventory of her collection as una pintura de Nuestra Señora con su hijo en brazos en, en la otra Don Diego de Guevara con una ropa uh, informada. Basically, the same information appears in the inventory of 1554 made at the time of her death. Uh, the if the identification is correct, then most likely the first owner was Diego de Guevara. Following the death of Mencia de Mendoza, we lose track, but both pictures apparently remained in or near Spain. The virgin and child is said to have come from someplace near Burgos and was acquired in 1914 by the Kaiser Friedrich Museum Verein. The portrait of Diego de Guevara uh, is first recorded, first question mark, in the collection of Don Sebastián Gabriel de Borbón y Braganza of Pau, who died in 1875. It passed from his heirs in 1876 to a private collection in Madrid and by, night, and by 1915, and then through a succession of dealers until it was acquired by Andrew Mellon in 1930 and is part of his founding gift to the National Gallery of Art. Uh, possibly bolstering the identification is the statement in Felipe de Guevara's Comentarios de la Pintura, written about 1560-63, referring to two portraits of his father, Don Diego de Guevara, one from the hand of Rugier, that is Rogier van der Weyden, and the other by Michiel, disciple of Rogier. The identification of the sitter as Diego de Guevara is, however, not absolute. Uh, Matthias Weiniger, who's here today, has raised the possibility that it might represent Francisco de Rojas, 
uh, whose dates are circa 1446 to 1523. De Rojas was ambassador to the Burgundian court for the Catholic kings, and he was a commander in the order of Calatrava, which will be important in a moment. Uh, Weiniger points to the thistle on the sitter's buttons, abrojo, and the color red, rojas, as alluding to the person, Roja, a portrait of a man generally given to Hans Memling in a private collection is thought to represent Francisco, although the coat of arms is not an exact match. As Weiniger himself notes, the sitter's brown hair does not match that of Sitow's donor, and even the dating, uh, uh, even if you date Memling's depiction earlier to the 1480s, it's hard to say that the man looks like the man portrayed by Sitow. Assuming it is Don Diego de Rivera, who was portrayed by Mikhail Sitow, what do we know about him? Uh, Diego de Guevara was the younger son of Ladron de Guevara, Lord of Escalante, who was from near Santana in the northern Spain. The year of his birth is not known, but it may have been around 1450. When he died in 1520, it is noted that Diego had worked for over 40 years at the Burgundian court, which means that he started sometime around 1480. He was a person of considerable importance and experience, and his career can be followed in some detail. He is said to have been with Charles the Bold at the Battle of Nancy in 1477, and in the entourage of Mary Burgundy at the time of her death in 1482. In 1501, uh, Diego de Guevara was a maître d'hôtel in the household of Philip the Fair, uh, and in 1506, he held the same position for the Queen Johanna of Castile during the journey of Philip and Johanna into Spain. Uh, Diego de Guevara was sent on, a dipl on diplomatic missions. He went to England in 1507 and was sent by Charles V again to England as ambassador in 1514-1515. Lauren Campbell has suggested that Sitow might have accompanied uh, Diego to England at this time. Uh, this is intriguing, especially as it might relate to Sitow's purported portrait of Mary Rose Tudor in Vienna, which is here also in the exhibition. In Brussels, Diego's house was in the Sablon and was adorned with tapestries and collections of coins and goldsmith's work or jewelry. He is buried in Notre Dame de Sablon in Brussels. Uh, Diego de Guevara collected art, although the full extent of his holdings is not known. He is probably best remembered or, as the first recorded owner of Jan van Eyck's portrait of Giovanni Arnolfini and his wife, dated 1434 in National Gallery London, a painting we all know. He gave the painting to Margaret of Austria, and it is recorded in 1516 uh, in the inventory of her collection. It is also stated that his coats of arms and device were on the wing panels, and this makes me wonder uh, if something similar was on the reverse of the Berlin-Washington diptych. It has also been put forward that Diego de Guevara was the original owner of one version of Hieronymus Bosch's Haywain triptych, either the one in the Prado or in the Escorial. The reasoning to my, my, my mind is not totally stringent or convincing. What is known is that in 1570, uh, he, Philip II purchased one version of the Haywain from the estate of Felipe de Guevara, the illegitimate son, and had it transferred to the Escorial in 1574. It is not known if it was the Prado or the Escorial version. Those that want to see Bosch's triptych coming from Diego's collection stress that in 1488, 1498, excuse me, 1499, Diego was a member of the Brotherhood of Our Lady in Sertogenbos and probably visited Sir Zogenbos as part of the entourage of Philip the Fair. There are two more bits of biographical information from the year 1517. In that year, he was one of the two cantadores mayores for accounts for Castile. And more importantly, um, Diego received the claveria, the wardenship of the Order of Calatrava from Charles V. And you can make out 
part of that order, what looks like a fleur-de-lis. This is one end of the cross, and it's just above the fingers of the proper right hand. In a technical examination indicates that the cross was painted over the brocade and originally gilded with a kind of a red lake embellishment. And just for fun, that's, that's what a cross of Calatrava looks like in the ent entirety, thanks to Google. And this is Diego's arms and his motto, or de Comte, superimposed over the cross of Calatrava. This is dated 1520 for the year of his death. Uh, it's now in the Archive de la Ville in Brussels and belongs to the Confraternity of the Seven Sorrows of the Virgin, uh, the Church of saint Gerry in Brussels. The Berlin-Washington diptych is usually dated between 1515 and 1518, that is after Sittau's journey in, in Denmark, where he was working for, uh, working for Margaret of Austria and Charles V. I like the idea that the Calatrava fragment was added in 1517 to the finished portrait, uh, the year before Sittau returned here to Tallinn for the last time. Since I'm on the subject, uh, here is on the screen is Jan Vermeijen's 1531 portrait of Felipe de Guevara, which is in the Clark Art Institute in Williamstown, Massachusetts. And it would appear that he is also wearing the order of, of Calatrava. In my catalog entry on the diptych, I wrote that the significance of the thistle on Diego's uh, button remains unknown talking about that. Uh, I would like to now offer a couple of thoughts. One way is to regard the thistle in connection with the goldfinch held by the Christ child. Uh, the goldfinch is at once a symbol of the soul and because the European goldfinch often, often has red on its head. This one does not. I'm talking about there. Uh, it is associated with the passion of Christ, or in this case, his future death. It is a well-known fact that goldfinches love to eat thistle seeds. Uh, and I can tell you from firsthand observation that goldfinches like, uh, like black-eyed Susans, but no Christian symbolism there. And thistles figure in the name of the bird in Italian, French, and German, distelfink. Uh, and it's certainly possible to associate the thistles on Diego's buttons with the goldfinch held by the Christ child and with the passion and Diego's veneration of, the Christ, of Christ and the Virgin. There is also, for what it's worth, is an order of Our Lady of the Thistle founded in France in 1370. I was not, a fine, I was not able to find a connection with Diego. But since we are in France in the late 14th century, there is a connection between thistles and the Burgundian court. It is found on the walls of the Chateau de Germol in the south of Burgundy. Uh, this was the residence of Philip the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, and his wife, Marguerite of Flanders. Uh, the wall decoration is by Jean de Beaumetz and shows the letters P for Philip and M for Marguerite, uh, and they are flanking a thistle. And it's a huge leap from thistles associated with the court of Burgundy in the late 14th century and Diego de Guevara in the early 16th century, but who knows. What are probably copies from the early 16th century of both the virgin and child, this is 35.5 by 26 centimeters, and the male portrait, 33.8 and by 23.5 centimeters. They exist in private collections. They are in the catalog. And as Greta, as she suggested, they may have originally belonged together as pendants. In closing, to repeat has been what has been said several times, uh, this is one of Mikhail Sitow's finest works. And for me, in the depth of emotion, a kind of pensive melancholy and devotion that defies precise description. This is one of the greatest portraits of the Renaissance in the North. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, John. So, ladies and gentlemen, are there questions or remarks? Yes. 
there was a pigmented uh, layer mentioned which uh, was found on one of the paintings in the diptych, but not in the other one. Was that a, a, an isolating layer on top of the ground or was it a, an underpaint? Thank you. John, you showed um, the portrait of maybe Francesco de Rojas. Of course, you know, this painting has been uh, known in different stages over the past couple of years. So the question there is the color of the hair, everything as this portrait has been, you know, essentially um, really reworked uh, rather radically. I think I wouldn't bet on the color of the hair okay. uh, there. Yeah, as, as Till said, the, the, we, the state, the condition of the picture is somewhat problematic. Is that a good word? Good. You, you, you exhibited it in 2002? And it changed. And it changed, yeah, because it was... It was a different yeah, yeah, so, yeah, big question mark there. <laughs> just want to express uh, my experience is scattered from the exhibition as during the summer I have had the opportunity to to talk about the exhibition on uh, uh, well more, more than 30 times so um, um, uh, I have taken some notes that uh, people um, have express their ideas and, and one of the things uh, has been of course that uh, there have been several uh, visitors who uh, don't buy the idea that the um, bird depicted could be goldfinch and even so that I had one visitor bringing uh, along a um, uh, bird guidebook opening it and uh, starting to compare. Also um, uh, I had opportunity to uh, look at the pe uh, painting together with uh, 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 Matti Gall, who uh, I don't know if he is still director of the zoo, uh, but who has been the director of the zoo, and, and then I discussed the problem with him. Could it be goldfinch or could it not? And he was certain that it's a chick, of gold, goldfinch chick. So for me, it made it uh, the iconography of the painting even more intriguing. So if you, if you represent Christ as a Christ child, so you will depict a goldfinch also as a chick. So, so that was just a, to uh, share the experiences that I've gathered from the exhibition. So a young Christ child is a young bird. Appears so, yeah. Uh, are there other remarks or questions? So John, uh, I have to play the Advocatus Diaboli just for this time. Um, you mentioned the reasons why this figure here is identified as Diego de Guevara. That's the inventory of uh, Mencia de Mendoza, of course, which is quite in, uh, well held in generic terms in a way. And then it is this testimony of his son, Felipe, and uh, the son says, well, there were two portraits of his father and one by Rochia von der Weiden. But uh, Diego de Guevara would have been 13 or 14 years old when Rochia von der Weiden died. And I think, so this is certainly not reliable. Yeah. Could have been, of course, a portrait by Memling or whatever. But I mean, from the time of Rochia, we do not know any portraits of children or young adolescents. Mm -hmm. So in this respect, he was certainly not correct that Philippe and well, of course, one can cast doubts on the, on the other um, uh, attribution of another portrait of his father to Michel Zito. Mm -hmm. So this is... No, you're, you're absolutely right. It, it's, uh, no, it is, it is not documented beyond a, a, a degree of doubt. And, and you have to keep, I think I've tried to indicate it, but you have to keep stuff like that in mind, that, yeah. you know, that it's not a document you can rely on. And, 
And still, yeah, that's why we, when we, uh, it, you know, we have a question mark after his name yes, yes, when we exactly, exhibit exactly. it. Because and I see the arguments pro, yeah. you know, I just wanted to mention that. Um, Matthias, don't you, yeah, finally, <laughs> Matthias <laughs> is pointing his finger, so yeah. maybe we can have a little bit of a discussion. Yeah. It's a mention of a portrait with a fur, yeah. of a man with a fur is extremely generic. If you look into the exhibition, you will find. Uh, that it was a stand, the rule and not the exception. So the fur does not say anything and then there is just the Calatrava flower. And with the, with the Francisco de Rojas portrait, I just try to open the discussion because one gets obsessed if there is a name. I don't exclude it, but um, you get accepted and you don't look at other options. And I think we really have to look at, at other options. Uh, things, things, things are not certain in this case. I much appreciate the comments from the visitors for the, for the bird. I think these <laughs> things that come from outside are always very important. And the notion that the red might be added later. This would make at least easier the chronology for Zito because otherwise the date would be very late uh, that the painting could have painted before his departure uh, to, to Tallinn. He would have had to make it on the last days of his stay in in the Netherlands. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, just one more question, maybe to all of you, but especially, of course, to John, and maybe also to Matthias and Till. I was always wondering about the dress of the sitter here. I mean, this uh, speckled fur, that is not so usual, and then that uh, the, the outer uh, uh, shell of his coat is of a light blue. I mean, we have seen so many portraits until showed us a couple of them. Normally, they have black or a very, or a very uh, somber color. And normally, this is brownish, or at least monochrome fur. But here, it's so unusual. So yeah, do you I have any really, explanation? I haven't really focused on that. Uh, yeah. And of course, you think of black as the color of the Burgundian court, right. and which was very expensive and, and black damask. And yeah, okay, you must not compare it to 15th century, that is certainly true. Mm -hmm. You're right, in the 16th. Nevertheless, I mean, this uh, 18th century blue, <laughs> I mean, you would think of uh, something uh, in the time of the Ancien Regime uh, with this light blue <laughs> jacket, but it's strange. Yeah, I, I, we agree on that. <laughs> Till, do you want to... I mean, I mean, if you, if you, you know, I think you have, a, you have a valid point there. I think the, the fur reoccurs and, you know, given the different stages of conservation, I think it's very difficult to make a definitive statement, but it's a portrait in Pittsburgh in the Carnegie Hall, I think attributed to Benson, it was a similar um, kind of light uh, speckled fur. I mean, the, the color is a different story. I wonder if this, um, this might be due to the um, erasion of some black pigment, uh, charcoal from the blue. So that it originally would have occurred and to be darker. The new attribution to yeah. the portrait from the new attribution to the has yeah. a similar fur. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, this uh, is lynx or what is it? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a lynx. Yeah. 